when you describe Stephen Gundry's claims like that, it's just, it's this same narrative. He could be talking about lectins. He could be talking about some other, quote, anti-nutrient. He could be talking about sugar and carbohydrate generally, like Gary Taubes. It's a singular unifying theme that provides a broad explanation for every condition we have, and they offer solutions to that. Why do we single out, you know, for example, one of the mechanisms with, with lectins is this increase in lipopolysaccharides. But you can see that with dietary saturated fat intake, and you won't hear anyone, <laughs> certainly on the you know carnivore side of the fence, discuss the increase in endotoxins and endotoxemia that are observed with high saturated fat. And this is not mechanistic. This has been demonstrated in some, for example, of Hanley Yiki Arvinen's uh, fatty liver research on you know high saturated fat intake. You could see increases in in uh, in endotoxin associated with the kind of you know uh, well that they were overfeeding by like a thousand calories a day of saturated fat are lectins toxic do they damage the gut lining cause leaky gut and increase inflammation do they make us fat and sick many accept these claims at face value making it not only acceptable but healthy to toss the beans in the bin and slap a thick grass-fed and grass-finished lectin-free steak on the barbecue. But what happens when we place these claims under the microscope? What kind of evidence are people pointing to? What kind of evidence is being overlooked? Is the avoidance of lectins harming our health? That's what I explore in this conversation with Dr. Alan Flanagan and Dr. Matthew Nagra. Enjoy. I might, I might just kick things off by taking a few moments here at the beginning to kind of set the stage before I pass the microphone over to you two so that the listeners kind of know what we're doing and, and how this episode came about. It seems that every five or ten years there's a new nutrient or a compound that is to blame for all of the chronic conditions that we're suffering from. Carbs are making us fat, or fat is clogging our arteries, gluten is damaging our gut, etc., etc. The list kind of goes on and on. And this makes for some interesting dinner table discussions, but it also leaves people feeling very, very confused. And it also leaves people often thinking that science is confused and we just don't understand what a healthy dietary pattern is. People are changing their minds all the time. And then more recently, thanks to a book called Plant Paradox, written by a cardiac surgeon, Dr. Stephen Gundry, the blame has shifted to lectins. And the biggest offenders, or lectin-rich foods, being legumes, whole grains, nuts, seeds, and nightshades, so tomatoes, eggplant, potatoes, bell peppers. And this is really confusing because these are foods that are recommended in the dietary guidelines. There are foods that physicians probably encourage their patients to consume more of. There are certainly food groups that many of the guests on this show have recommended people consume more of if they're wanting to lower their risk of certain diseases. Um, So that's kind of in a nutshell why we're here. We're here to talk about the plant paradox and this idea that lectins are at the the base or or our root cause of chronic disease. Before we sort of get into the specifics of Dr. Gundry's claims and whether there is any validity to them or not, I think it would be good to get people up to speed on what lectins are, a little bit of a lectins kind of 101, in case they're not sure exactly what people are referring to, but I hear the term kind of being thrown around. Matt, do you want to kick us off here? What exactly are lectins? Yeah, lectins are um, they're a class of carbohydrate binding proteins, and they're really ubiquitous. I mean, they're found across the plant kingdom. They're found in animals. We have them in our body. They're found in fungi. And there are many, many different types. I think that's one thing that kind of gets lost is this, you know, the fact that there are many different kinds that bind to many different types of carbohydrates, and they just get lumped into this idea of lectins. They're bad for you. You have to avoid all these you know, plant foods, um, when really they behave very, very differently. 
And gluten is a lectin, right? That is true, yeah. So what is the, I guess, the function of lectins in plants? Are they, are they part of a plant's defense system? That seems to be what's thrown out a lot. So there are different types of functions. Again, like I said, different types of lectins as well. Um, they're involved with cell-to-cell signaling because they can bind to carbohydrates on certain cell structures. For example, they might be able to signal in certain ways. Um, so they're important for signaling pathways. They also are important for defense against pathogens. At least some of them are. So things like bacteria or other microbes that could perhaps attack that plant, um, they could defend against that. So in a sense, I guess so. You know, They, they could be considered those defense chemicals, but um, they have a variety of different functions. So... Based on the fact that there are many different lectins, I guess right here at the top, are we taking the position that we shouldn't treat all lectins the same? They shouldn't just be lumped underneath one umbrella? Absolutely. Like, why would we consider uh, lectins from, I know we'll get to kidney beans, so hemagglutinin from kidney beans to the same way that we treat lectins from perhaps wheat you know, the same way we treat lectins from viruses or bacteria. It doesn't make any sense to do that. They all are completely different and they function in different ways. Was there anything there that you wanted to add to, Alan? Uh, no, uh, not particularly in terms of the definition. Um, I think just to tee up something that we'll probably get into down the line, is, is Matt identified that m- multiple structural functions involved in signaling um, and their binding capacity and their ubiquity are important for the claims that you will see made often on the basis of mechanistic or in vitro or indeed animal studies that might suggest an adverse effect. So we know that, for example, that there can be binding to epithelial tissues in the, in the intestines, that there can be binding even with microbes or both. And so that at least mechanistically might provide a basis to say, oh, this is a pathway through which there could be, for example, intestinal um, aggravation. Uh, but again, we can we can kind of get into some of the evidence around that. And, and the, the question that I always would posit on something like this for people to leave a tab open on that we'll explore is, you know, what have we got in terms of human outcomes um, for these? But I think... Yeah, as, as, as far as their broad carbohydrate binding ability goes, this is a very diverse structural function of carbohydrates generally. Um, and so the idea that we could kind of have a broad general conversation about lectins, quote unquote, we're specifically focused on glycan binding proteins in, in plant foods uh, derived from plants. Um, And even within that classification, there's structural diversity and there's no singular term that could be applied. Is this a topic of confusion that the the pair of you are are regularly kind of met with on social media with people commenting or sending you direct messages that seem confused about lectins? All the time, yeah. I I would say I get that pretty frequently and... uh, I know you you know about it. I just had a, a big debate with a, a carnivore proponent, and this certainly came up there as well. And uh, I'll be pulling from some of those notes, I'm sure. But um, yeah, it, it's it's huge online right now, um, and it has been over the last even four or five years. Uh, Gundry is 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 obviously someone who has popularized the concept, but I've even come across it in in some of the kind of biohacking spheres as well. Um, you know, related to like autoimmunity and otherwise. So. Um, yeah, it's, 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 I think it would be a, a fairly common enough, uh, claim that people have encountered. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We will probably touch on inflammation and autoimmunity at some stage, just to bring people up to speed a, a bit further with regards to Dr. Gundry's, um, sort of thesis or my understanding of his thesis and I hope that I'm representing it accurately, is that while plants, those foods I listed before, like legumes and whole grains and nuts and seeds, that whilst they contain beneficial compounds, they also contain toxins, notably lectins, that can negatively affect your health. And that's that's the paradox, hence the name plant paradox. And Dr. Gundry 
he he speaks of a variety of different kind of quote unquote toxins as he labels it, but really focuses most on lectins. And as I said, he believes they explain the majority of diseases in the Western world. And his solution is to avoid the most lectin rich foods, properly prepare the foods from his very short list of plant foods that are safe to eat, and then to shield yourself from any lectins that inevitably find their way into your mouth with his lectin shield supplement. What's your immediate reaction to this thesis? (laughs) 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 There's a really, I mean, I, I like the way Simon, that you kind of laid that out, right? There's a very well-worn path to, the, to, to, to kind of claims that we see in the health space broadly, nutrition in particular. And it starts with the identification of the thing, you know, in the food we were told to eat for health is actually what you want to avoid. So we were told to eat X, this is why you should eat Y, the specifics of that claim can change from quack to quack, but that's the core genesis of it. And then you proceed from there to, you know, whatever shreds of evidence they can use to build up that claim. And then of course, this thing in food that we were told to eat, but we shouldn't is also the quote unquote root cause. And so it's not that it's necessarily specific to any condition. It's in fact a uniform explanation for all conditions. And you can achieve health by removing this thing and also purchasing an $80 supplement. And it's just, it's such a, it's such an incredible blueprint, right? As a template, you know, we we could sit here now and come up with the next one if we just thought long and hard enough about something in food. (laughs) um and so and yet and yet i mean i know we can laugh at it but yet this type of sequential narrative is incredibly persuasive to people um especially and here's the thing i would uh, i guess to 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 slightly um be fair to particularly people with gastrointestinal issues irritable bowel syndrome or otherwise there's a lot of gaps in knowledge that we have the difference between people that are trying to at least here to a scientific way of thinking about it is we don't just fill in the gaps with whatever uh, mechanistic speculation or otherwise. And unfortunately, the gaps are often manipulated by someone like a Stephen Gundry to mount a specific claim. And that can be incredibly persuasive to people if you're someone who has, you know, uh, symptoms and you're not really getting any resolution from the generic kind of advice you might get, or even from a frontline or sorry, second line intervention, like a low FAPMAP diet. Uh, And then where do you go? And of course, this is where claims like this made by someone with a degree of authority bias can become incredibly persuasive for people. Um, So there is a challenge there in terms of trying to balance what we know with what gaps may exist. Um, but yeah, I think when you when you describe Stephen Gundry's claims like that, it's just it's this same narrative. He could be talking about lectins, he could be talking about some other quote anti nutrient, he could be talking about sugar and carbohydrate generally, like Gary Taubes. It's a singular unifying theme that provides a broad explanation for every condition we have, and they offer solutions to that. I might be skipping forward a little bit here because we're yet to dig into his claims, but. I think it's it's important to kind of hit up the top here as well. Is it possible that Dr. Gundry's thesis, his position is wrong, but someone could read his book, make the changes he recommends, and feels better? Oh, I would say, of, of course. I mean, you never know. For, for each individual, they might have difficulty with certain foods. Um, There are certain intolerances, there are food allergies, there are all sorts of reasons that someone could react negatively to a specific food. And by eliminating this broad category of foods, yeah, there's a chance that you hit that problematic food or or few foods. Um, And so when someone makes those kinds of changes, they feel better. It can be, 
even more convincing to them, you know, versus just, just hearing the stories. Um, so yeah, I think it's absolutely possible, but there are better ways to narrow in on what the problem is without eliminating all of these, what are really healthy foods. Um, yeah. Which I think could have a, you know, negative consequences down the road. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if we, if we take, for example, let, let's take a food we'll probably discuss several times today is like beans generally, or red kidney beans to be very specific. And we know, for example, if we're characterizing uh, individuals with IBS compared to non-IBS controls, one of the characteristics is hypersensitivity to distension. There's the same amount of hydrogen produced as a byproduct of fermentation of non-digestible carbohydrates, but there's hypersensitivity in some individuals compared to others. So absolutely, it's possible that as a byproduct of a food fiber-rich, that there is this effect. And so they, so, so what, you know, and it's really important because what's Matt, what Matt's describing is important. It's correctly identifying what may be at play and why, rather than people getting sold down. Oh, it's, it's for the wrong reasons that they're then going on what could be a very exclusionary diet for, for the wrong reasons. And then paying 80 bucks for a supplement. <laughs> and then paying 80 bucks for lectin shield. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just to reiterate what you said, Alan, it is, it is, it's a playbook. Step one, everything you've been told, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And then once, <laughs> once you hear that, you're, you're waiting to be told, well, what, what is actually to blame? <laughs> so that's step two. You know, now that we've established that, that, let's introduce something else to blame for poor health. And then step three, let's sell you some type of solution. Uh, so the claims that I, that I want to kind of zoom in on here are number one, and we've kind of hit this, but everything you've been taught about diet and your health is wrong. Um, number two that I see come up quite a bit is lectins cause leaky gut. Number three, which is somewhat, uh, related to number two, lectins cause inflammation or is often related within the same story that there's damage to the gut lining, increased intestinal permeability, and subsequently infl inflammation. Number four, again, somewhat related to number two and three, lectins cause uh, autoimmune conditions or can worsen them, and avoiding lectins has been shown to cure autoimmune conditions. And number five, lectins cause weight gain. Just to kind of close the loop on number one, the everything you've been taught about diet and your health is wrong. I I thought it was interesting that in his in his book Plant Paradox, he says that in the introduction, but then in chapter one he kicks it off saying eating shellfish and egg yolks dramatically reduces cholesterol. As I said in the introduction, forget everything you thought you knew was true. So what, what I take from this is he's saying that dietary cholesterol reduces serum cholesterol and the, you know, forget the guidelines that have kind of recommended people limit dietary cholesterol over, over the years. And there's some nuance in, in that and that's kind of irrelevant here, but he's, he's sort of making the claim that these foods rich in dietary cholesterol dramatically reduce cholesterol. And all you have to do is look at that first reference and, 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 and see that it was a clinical trial that looked at a group of, of healthy, um, normal lipidemic men. So their, their cholesterol levels were normal and they had a diet rich in saturated fat and animal protein. And then they had some people swap some of that animal protein rich in saturated fat for shellfish and of course their cholesterol serum cholesterol went down they were eating much less saturated fat and more polyunsaturated fats but dr gundry here is kind of attributing that reduction in serum cholesterol to the cholesterol in shellfish and he's kind of tacked on egg yolks there um so he's He's kind of doubling down on this idea that you need to rethink what you know, but the problem here is that that study is actually well supported by the dietary guidelines. 
And the authors in that paper say that the reduction in cholesterol that these subjects eating shellfish is explained by a reduction in saturated fat and an increase in polyunsaturated fats. You know, so not that you would expect the average reader to kind of go into that first study, but if someone did, you can kind of already begin to see how this book is going to play out. Uh, I wonder if we can give people a heuristic to work with for these kind of claims. When you see a book written by some someone MD that launches with everything you know about nutrition is wrong, a good heuristic for people to maybe think about is actually that's like a dog whistle for everything this person's going to say is likely going to be wrong. <laughs> this person's not, going to probably not this, far off. <laughs> this person's guaranteed to get the interpretations wrong. Like. <laughs> and if we double click on that further here, Alan, uh, you know, taking the position that the 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 dietary guidelines is wrong and that there's some other explanation. Maybe you can walk us back through some some of the data and it can be high level, but there is evidence that suggests you know, if people moved more towards dietary guidelines, I know there was that study looking at the UK dietary guidelines, that this does improve either biomarkers or health outcomes. Yeah, like we, we, we can think pretty pretty high level for this one, right? This claim everything you know about nutrition is wrong or everything the research or the science tells us is wrong is so demonstrably false and it's it generally at best relied on either in that case a complete misinterpretation so it's not even an accurate example or it's relied on for example you can see certain authors will still say well because dairy fats may behave slightly differently in these control studies on blood lipids. Our dietary guidelines for saturated fat as a broad group are wrong. So it's either based on misinterpreted data, gross over extrapolations and generalizations. And actually, I think people miss these broad, multiple examples of where nutrition science produced evidence from epidemiology that ended up congruent with uh, intervention trials in some cases or mechanistic work in others so we have the example of you know folic acid and neural tube defects originally identified in case control studies confirmed in some prospective studies confirmed in randomized control trials uh, we have the example of trans fats in the food supply we didn't even need an rct to to show that although you could retrospectively attribute metabolic ward research that looked at partially hydrogenated fats and you could you could link using the same food, for example, groundnut oil, and you could see in its natural form as an unsaturated fat-rich oil, lower levels of cholesterol, but in the partially hydrogenated version, cholesterol going through the roof. So across multiple domains or multiple isolated examples, we have seen nutrition science produce successful interventions for the public health. And then that's a kind of specific nutrient level examples at the kind of broader level of a dietary pattern. Most of our knowledge has been distilled into general guidelines. They appear slightly differently from nation to nation uh, at a national level in terms of specifics or even how they're presented graphically or the, the specifics of the recommendations in terms of some foods. But broadly speaking, as characteristics of diet, they're relatively uniform in suggesting that saturated fats are lowered and replaced with unsaturated fats and complex carbohydrates are preferred over refined. Um, fruits and vegetables are consumed, you know, at least five a day, which is the compromise because ideally it would be higher, but we need to be realistic with public health recommendations. And whether you're looking at WHO recommendations, which they did in the UK Biobank cohort, so international guidelines, or you look at UK national guidelines and adherence within a population, or you look at adherence to the Nordic Nutrition Councils as they've done in the Denmark-Copenhagen study and they've done in a couple of other uh, Scandinavian cohorts, or you look at adherence to the US dietary guidelines. 
whatever national level adherence you're looking at, you will see that compared to lower adherence, higher adherence is associated with lower risk of mortality outcomes, cardiometabolic disease in particular, which we're primarily concerned with. So the the just as a just as a testable proposition, everything we know about nutrition is wrong. If we treat that as an empirical statement rather than just a, a kind of marketing tool, it, it's demonstrably falsifiable whether we're talking about dietary patterns or even whether we're talking about some of the specific nutrient examples, which I think are are great success stories of nutrition science. Something else that has just popped popped uh, in mind is so Gundry's creating this this kind of scenario where he's he's telling you what you've been told is wrong and he's about to shift the blame to something else lectins and part of that story is that these as I mentioned earlier these lectin containing foods are things like legumes and, and whole grains fruits and vegetables do we know much about the lectin content of the typical diet because at face value, it seems it, it seems difficult to blame foods that the average person is probably not eating a lot of based on what typical diets look like in Western countries. I mean, I think that's a, a fair point, too, especially when you consider you know, the majority of calories coming from ultra-processed foods in America, for example. Um, they tend to have lower lectin content than, I mean, Gundry himself put out a video about white rice versus brown rice saying, when you remove the germ, you're removing the lectins. And so I, I, I'm not sure if that sort of analysis has been done. I honestly don't see the importance of doing that type of analysis, but I wouldn't be surprised if the lectin content is much lower um, uh, than what he may be suggesting, um, you know, even if it's not overtly. But uh, Going back to something that that Alan said too, I just wanted to touch on was when you look at um, like healthy eating index scores, for example. So so people's diets can be scored according to how closely they are, you know, fitting the the dietary guidelines. Um, you see that there's roughly a twenty percent lower risk of all cause mortality with those following the guidelines more closely with a, high, a higher healthy eating index score. So um, that's sort of what we have to zoom back out to, like, like Alan suggested, just looking at the outcomes and looking at what happens to people when they actually follow these. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question about the lectin content of the diet, I'm not sure. It's probably lower than than would be suggested. But uh, but even to that, Matt, what would be, what would be interesting is if you're... So, for example, if we're thinking about the actual foods that are claimed, well, that are actually on, you know, uh, higher in lectins, and you would look at traditional populations, or sorry, populations consuming them as part of a traditional or habitual diet, um, and outcomes in 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 those populations. Now, there's obviously multiple factors that would go into that, but I would I would believe we could formulate a, at least a hypothesis that you know populations consuming diets with more of these foods as part of the habitual diet compared to an average western population and we know what the outcome data for the typical western diet is so the idea that even we could draw a straight line between lectin content of diet in a western context you know, knowing that there are diets which would have habitually higher levels of these foods consumed in them. I just even think, I think even as a hypothesis, it's it's riddled with holes already. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point. Absolutely. Okay, the second claim was lectins cause leaky gut. Matt, have you seen any any evidence for this? Um. So one of the one of the things that has come up um, is this idea that certain lectins or lectin containing foods um, can contain even non lectin compounds, but we'll say lectins for sake of argument, um, can bind to uh, what are called toll like receptors, and these can uh, trigger inflammation in the gut, uh, perhaps lead to intestinal permeability. And this is usually demonstrated in, say, animal models where they'll actually place the the compounds right into the intestine or the intestinal wall and see what happens um, or perhaps in a petri dish with certain epithelial cells that would typically line the gut uh, and you see yeah there may be some adverse effects in that context but 
that's not what we're looking at. We want to look at in the context of a functioning human body, what actually happens. And we don't actually see that. There might be certain markers of intestinal permeability that rise when you give gluten to people with, say, celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but we already know they have problems with gluten, right? That doesn't pertain to the 95-ish, roughly, percent of people who don't have issues with gluten um, or other lectins, perhaps. And so I'm... uh, I think that's where it largely stems from. But the irony there is that there are bacterial endotoxins in meat, for example, um, that can also bind to those same toll-like receptors and lead to intestinal permeability in the similar sort of context, those preclinical studies and whatnot. Why is it that we're pointing the finger at these uh, lectins when you could easily point the fingers at the foods that they are recommending? At the end of the day, what we have to do is step back, look at the human health outcome data and seeing does this lead to worse outcomes in humans when they're consuming it? Um, and in that case, we just don't see that. Yeah, that there's there's a, a really good point there, which is that why do we single out, you know, for example, one of the mechanisms with, with lectins is this increase in lipopolysaccharides. But you can see that with dietary saturated fat intake, and you won't hear anyone, <laughs> certainly on the you know, carnivore side of the fence, discuss the increase in endotoxins and endotoxemia that are observed with high saturated fat. And this is not mechanistic. This has been demonstrated in some, for example, of Hanley Iki Arvinen's uh, fatty liver research on, you know, high saturated fat intake. You could see increases in, in, uh, in endotoxin associated with the kind of you know, uh, well, they were overfeeding by like a thousand calories a day of saturated fat. But again, this was demonstrated in, in a human context. Whereas like Matt said, you know, animal models, yes, high doses. But and a really important point, Matt said, animal models and cell culture studies are often using the isolated compound itself. And from a from a from a scientific and, and and kind of methodological standpoint, this is crucial because this is not necessarily at all analogous to cooking and preparing red kidney beans and feeding them to humans. So they're very different concept, you know, conceptual approaches that that you know, obviously, someone like a Stephen Gundry is unconcerned with because he's only concerned with framing the specifics of his claim. But in terms of assessing research that's available, that's a really important factor. And ultimately, it doesn't appear, at least I haven't seen, any human data that would suggest, obviously, Matt highlighted someone with individuals with celiac. But outside of that, I haven't seen any human trials using, for example, cooked beans that would show any sort of corroboration to some of the in vitro or animal model studies on effects of isolated lectins on intestinal epithelial function or or uh, inflammatory markers. Right. So what you're saying there is that lectins could behave differently or affect physiology differently in an isolated form versus within a food matrix and consumed as as a whole food. Well, and that that isolated form is not independent of dose. Um, you know, the doses used of an isolated form mechanistically uh, in in vitro research or in an animal model are often relative to, you know, a human organism um, physiologically a lot higher than uh, what would be achieved from a normal diet. I think this is an important point. So remind people, how should we think about animal studies? So let's think bigger picture here, not even just this lectin conversation. They're on social media and they they see an in vitro um, or an, an animal study being shared and being used as evidence to support some type of dietary change, food behavior. What do you want people to to kind of pause and, and think about? That the, the proper place of it is, and it is important, uh, in vitro research is important. Cell culture research is important. Animal models are important. They're important to investigate uh, potential pathways, potential mechanisms, 
potential dose responses if food additives are being introduced into the food supply. So that's a particularly important concept when it comes to artificial sweeteners. And people will make claims about neurotoxicity, but they're deliberately pushing doses up to try and identify what will ultimately be known as the no adverse, um, no observed adverse effect level. So these models of research are important, but they are experimental research. Okay, and there's a term that's often used like translational science, right? Ultimately, if it's going to have validity for for humans and human outcomes, there needs to be translation from those preclinical models or cell culture studies across into humans. So those models often serve as a starting point, um, but they need to then be translated into uh, into in vivo effects, i.e. in living humans. And you quite often, depending on what we're talking about, do not see that translational adverse effects that you might see. Uh, and so in their proper place, they do provide important context and information. So Simon, you shared a study that you said Stephen Gundry apparently relies on, on lectin activity, a study I think was published in 1989, um, and you look at a study like that, for example, which was conducted in rats and looked at their growth trends, fed diets that were containing raw kidney beans or kidney beans cooked at various temperatures. And so in that study, for example, whether kidney beans in terms of the gram amount per kilogram of body weight, and remember rats are fairly small organisms compared to humans, 100 to 150 to 200 grams of raw kidney beans per kilogram of, of the rat's body weight when cooked at 100 degrees, you know, when boiled, completely eradicated any presence of, uh, or any evidence of growth inhibition that was observed. And so, so, so someone can look at that study and see growth inhibition from raw and uh, kidney beans in that, in that study and go running off with it saying, look, this is an example of an adverse effect of, but again, it's not even a representation of the study itself. And so what would be more relevant as a data point from this study to take into available human evidence would actually be the evidence in relation to the effects of cooking. And indeed, if we, if we do look at, uh, you know, um, the, 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 the impacts of properly proper preparation, that would be consistent with why we would assume that there wouldn't be these constant negative effects uh, in humans because those preparation methods are typically used. Would it be fair to say that for a food group like legumes or whole grains, when we're talking about preparation, um, we're talking about soaking and cooking, and if done using, I guess, the typical methods for that, that the majority, if not all, lectins are removed or at least the lectins that could be problematic? Yeah, I mean, if you're cooking to the point that they're soft and edible, so um, I mean, you can squish it with a fork. That's usually the little test that I, I suggest, right? If you can squish it with a fork, chances are the lectins are down into single digit percentages, if not eradicated altogether uh, or undetectable. And in that case, yeah, it's safe to eat. Canned legumes are already cooked and safe to eat. Um, so it I mean, yes, there are cases where where there have been lectin poisoning from undercooked or, say, dry roasted kidney beans or something like that, where they're not prepared in, in a proper way. Um, those cases are very rare, typically, and they'll be concentrated in, you know, a specific kitchen was preparing them in the incorrect way. And, and during a day of, of eating, a bunch of people got sick or or what have you. But um, but fortunately, this isn't common. And, and yeah, there might need to be a little more education around that for certain people or certain groups of people, but, but really it's not that challenging. And, and, you know, if, if you go, uh, I always point to my, my Indian background, you go to India, um, everyone's preparing these properly. We don't hear about, uh, lectin poisoning cases over there. Just, just to say that, 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 that is important because it could be a, a source of where people again, use to build this negative case. You, you can find, and this is not controversial or even disputed evidence of, uh, suspected uh, cases of um, poisoning or or food poisoning or toxicity 
and hospital admissions related to consumption of raw uh, or improperly uh, cooked uh, seeds or legumes. And there was one study I saw which was in the UK covering a 13-year period from 1976. And in that time frame, there were 50 incidents. Okay, so as Matt said, it's not particularly common and it is very much related to either uh, consumption of uh, the kind of raw, uncooked legumes or unripe seeds. Um, and again, th- that's this this is almost negated for most people consuming these foods now because they'll likely be buying uh, preformed um, or pre-cooked canned versions. Um, but 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 those those cases are explainable, and you know they're in many respects the exception that proves the rule. You yeah, know, I was just gonna say just to point out sort of another double standard, like we we did with the whole you know saturated fat uh, and uh, and leaky gut, you know, so to speak, issue is if you look at undercooked meat, you know, what are the risks of that? Right, it, this this idea of of a food being harmful because certain cases of poisoning have occurred when improperly prepared, if you look at just um, salmonella from chicken alone in the U.S., it's estimated at about 100 deaths a year. Just salmonella from chicken, forget about E. coli from you know, beef or anything else, uh, for hospitalizations, hundreds of thousands. Um, or sorry, tens of thousands. And for, for illnesses, hundreds of thousands. So, And that's in a single year versus over a 13-year period in the U.K. So it's just, again why point the finger here rather than just educate people like, hey, make sure that your beans are soft when you eat them. Um, it really doesn't have to be that complicated. And, and uh, you know, you don't have to turn a blind eye to the other issues. Just to reemphasize some of those points Alan made about animal studies, which I think is a really important learning, is <clears throat> the importance of, of dose in those studies. Um, you know, often is not representative of the exposure that would occur in a in a human with a typical diet now the importance of the way in which that compound is delivered is it in a whole food is it isolated has it been prepared properly all of these things are going to influence how likely those results are to play out in in humans now not to mention that often those those preclinical studies are looking at a single mechanism you know, and when we kind of zoom out and look at the health outcomes, we get a bit more of an idea as to the kind of net effect of that exposure across many mechanisms. Um, the other thing I would add to that that I thought was interesting is that when when these petri dish studies or animal studies are kind of used to create fear, generate fear around lectins, and I think you could almost find a... <laughs> a petri dish study or an animal study to generate fear over every single (laughs) compound or the the main compounds in our diets just about but what you won't hear with regards to these types of studies um, and lectins is some of the potential beneficial properties that lectins may have and i have a quote here from a, a study that says, in contrast to the anti-nutritional characteristics of lectins initially proposed by many researchers, some evidence suggests that lectins may have therapeutic benefits and could be used as functional foods and nutraceutical agents. Because of lectins' strong affinity and specificity to glycans, interest lies in their potential as both cancer diagnostic and treatment tools. Now, I'm not suggesting that this means that lectins are the next treatment for cancer. But you can see how the same argument could be created if we were to go and cherry pick this evidence. I mean, all you have to do is ask someone to search lectins in PubMed and you'll see, and they're all, they're all reviews. Don't, this is not you know human outcome evidence for the most part. It's reviews based on animal models and cell culture studies. But there's interest in lectins, and this goes to the point Matt made at the very start in terms of defining them. There's been interest in lectins in terms of uh, immune modulating effects in a positive sense. There's a couple of reviews in relation to the potential benefit for for SARS-CoV-2 specifically. 
There's interest in anti-carcinogenic, other uh, immune modulated conditions, HIV, for example. So I think that point is obviously, it's spot on. You can use, you know, you could easily be writing, you know, the lectin code or the lectin solution. <laughs> 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 New York Times best it has to right be, there. It has to be code or solution if it's, you know. Yeah. And, <laughs> and and you could be writing a book about how these compounds are going to, you know, prevent HIV and cure cancer and, cure, you know, ward off COVID. And this is, it's great. You might have just given someone an idea. And, and yeah, someone's <laughs> going to do that. And then Alan's going to be responsible for the next, like, wave of nutrition pseudoscience <laughs> okay the the third claim i get the feeling we're going to to follow a similar theme as we move through these but the, the third one that that pops up that dr gundry has made and others who are kind of generating fear around lectins often make is that lectins cause inflammation my understanding is that there's actually some specific studies. I think, Matt, you and I have spoken about these previously, uh, if I recall, that have looked at feeding uh, lectin-containing foods to people and measuring markers of inflammation. Yeah, um, actually, a, a really good paper I, I loved by, uh, I'm going to butcher his name, but Schwingshackel. So I had a German friend who laughed at me for pronouncing it wrong, but that's how I pronounce it. Um, anyways, um, he has a network meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. So this is where you sort of pool data from multiple uh, trials looking at different foods and, and you uh, sort of estimate how or what the effect of each one would be relative to others. And um, they found that of the various foods, and they looked at meat, dairy, um, whole grains, nuts, uh, refined grains as well, I think, and legumes. They found that the nuts and whole grains, both lectin-containing foods, were amongst the best as far as anti-inflammatory effects um, based on their scores that they were given. Uh, legumes were sort of middle of the table, but still not 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 at the bottom, not you know suggesting that they're inflammatory. Um, and so if it's the case that these lectin-containing foods are causing inflammation, we should see them be near the bottom. We should see things like the, the meat and the dairy being at the top, but um, that just wasn't really the case. So I would say that, yeah, when you take a step back and look at the actual human clinical trial data, we see that these plant foods tend to be quite beneficial, um, at least for inflammatory markers. Alan, anything to add, add to that? Are you happy with that? And that's, yeah, that's, and it's consistent for whole grains as well um, uh, as legumes. So, and obviously whole grains are like less, less of a kind of lectin rich food necessarily as a food group compared to legumes. But there's just, it's really difficult to make any sort of supported claim that any relevant markers of cardiometabolic risk, whether that's blood lipids, um, insulin resistance, glucose tolerance, blood pressure, or in this case, inflammation, are increased with any of these foods. Um, and as Matt said, the comparators are, of course, important. So... I just, I'd wonder what is being, uh, you know, used to support that claim. Although, again, noting that Red Pen Reviews scored the plant paradox at 26% for scientific accuracy, I think that can, you know, tell us what we need to know about what studies might be supporting his claim specific to inflammation. But I think we could really quite confidently say on the basis of the majority of evidence that there is, that there is no concern uh, in human outcome data for legumes, whole grains, or some of these other plant foods in relation to inflammatory markers. I scored 95% for scientific accuracy. Uh, there so you go. Boys are aware. Uh, there you go. But actually, well done. I, uh, <laughs> I have both of you to thank for that because you, you each of you re reviewed different parts of the book. <laughs> so I can't take, can't take full credit for that. Thank God. Um, <laughs> 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 Can you imagine if you reviewed it? You reviewed you got it like fifty percent. <laughs> I just retired. I mean, take, take my name off of it. <laughs> yeah, I give up. <laughs> okay, autoimmune conditions. Lectins cause autoimmune conditions. 
avoiding lectins has been shown to cure autoimmune conditions. I will say this one seems to be uh, something that a lot of people are writing about online in various plant paradox groups. I've seen people talking about reversing their psoriasis. So there's a lot of anecdotal kind of evidence. What do we think about this claim? Is there any validity to it? I think I sent both of you, and I don't expect you to have, have read this, uh, a study that I found on one of these forums that people were sharing that looked at um, immune response to lectins in sort of, I think, 500 individuals, males and females, suggested that maybe some, some people do have an immune response. What do we think about this? So I actually had a look at that this morning, um, and I haven't read it in, in very granular detail, but I thought it was an interesting example of potentially how something could, again, be over-extrapolated. So they had specimens from 500 healthy people and were looking at levels of antibodies, IgG, IgM, IgA, and IgE. From a food allergy perspective, we would be typically looking at the IgE antibody for food intolerance, people often look at IgG, but it's not a marker of food intolerance. It's actually a marker of 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 uh, of, of tolerance, essentially. Um, and you could see certain increases that were greater than the average in multiple of these markers, not just IgE, but the percentages were relatively low. Uh, so on the whole, most of the samples, and this is this is culturing the human blood with levels of these um, of uh, of different lectins. It, that to me wouldn't be a particularly persuasive uh, in you know a, a example of these foods being particularly problematic. Although if we were to I guess, take it at its highest, it might indicate that at least a, a, some small proportion of individuals, but we wouldn't be able, again, because of the methodology of this study, to come away with that conclusion until this was actually repeated in a kind of more in vivo setting. Uh, so yeah, I just, again, I can see how an online community of people who aren't really interested in the methodology and the context of the wider research around an area would take something like this and run off with it. But I don't think it would be particularly persuasive. And I don't think it would be something that you could conclude uh, that this is in fact an effect worth considering until it was shown in an in vivo context. And the fact that other antibodies like IgG were elevated, uh, it just looked, a little bit unspecific to me. And I would bet if you were to repeat that with other compounds found in other foods, um, you'd probably get similar results. So you, you'd probably have a small number of people with with slightly higher levels of, of certain antibodies um, versus you know mm -hmm. others. So yeah, it, it's one of those things where you need to take a step back and look at the broader evidence, the human outcome data, and is there any? And and you know, as Alan suggested, there really isn't at this point. And it does seem like it's a case of of people perhaps sort of jumping the gun or running with it and misinterpreting it because the authors themselves, I have a little quote from them here in front of me, they weren't getting carried away and they were actually warning people not to get carried away with the results of their own study. They said these findings are greatly different from the unjustified claims in a book that was published in 2017. In The Plant Paradox, Dr. Stephen Gundry argues that lectins, a group of naturally occurring proteins found in nearly all plants, are the root cause of most illness illnesses plaguing modern society and therefore should be completely removed from our diet. We strongly disagree with this kind of misleading blanket, blanket condemnation of all lectins at all times everywhere. And then to Alan's last point, they go on to say clinical trials would be needed to determine correlations between given anti-lectin antibodies and particular autoimmune diseases. Okay, so that's autoimmune conditions. And maybe there could be some interesting trials that, that are um, run in the near future and, and something that we could kind of revisit. 
So that brings us to number five, which I thought was particularly interesting. Dr. Gundry's claim that lectins cause weight gain. I was really interested to understand the mechanism that he was proposing by which lectins have this effect. Um, so I went and listened to a number of his interviews, both on his channel and others, and he said repeatedly that lectins cause you to pack on the pounds. And he explains that they do this, or at least his hypothesis or what he believes is that they do this by increasing inflammation, something we've already spoken about, which then affects hormones, increasing fat storage in the abdomen. Is there any evidence that either of you have come across that would corroborate this, that lectins cause people to gain weight or more specifically weight around the abdomen? No. Um, well, you know, <laughs> yes, I was going to say no, but uh, speaking of the, the mechanism, I mean, we already touched on the issue with inflammation, right? I'm going to try to get through it. <laughs> we already touched on the issue with inflammation. Um, and how there isn't really evidence to support that. So that kind of severs the whole mechanism right there. Uh, but then if you look, again, zoom out at, at the outcome data, you look at legume consumption. Um, there was a, a meta-analysis looking at different food groups and risk of overweight and obesity published in 2019. Um, and this one found that legume consumption was associated with a 12% lower risk of overweight or obesity. Um, so you know, my question then to, to uh, Gundry would be, well, why is it the case that higher legume consumption is associated with a lower risk of overweight obesity if they're quote unquote responsible or if the lectins are are quote unquote responsible for weight gain? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. And and so um yeah, it, I, I think that's really where that whole debate ends. Oh, the, just just to add that that's confirmed in in intervention trials. There are John Stephen Piper's mm -hmm, group. Absolutely produced a meta-analysis of pulses and legumes, um, both observational and, and RCT data, randomized controlled trials. And the randomized controlled trials, I think there was 21 studies, and at an average dose of 130-odd grams of pulses a day, um, that was associated with a 0.34 kilo lower body weight. Um, and, a, and around a you know thirty percent, a point three uh, four percent reduction in body fat. So you know again, intervention, human interventions confirm observational associations that these foods are associated with improved uh, you know body weight and adiposity. And interestingly, those interventions included both trials at like isocaloric weight maintenance levels of energy intake and also you know hypocaloric energy restricted uh, diets um and again there's probably there's more plausible mechanistic explanations in terms of impacts on satiety and otherwise that would explain those effects so um it's not that even there's no mechanistic plausibility to his claim to gundry's claim it's the evidence is in the opposite direction entirely. <laughs> and just to clarify something in case someone is, is hearing what you're saying, Alan, and is interested in how those legumes in those studies had been prepared, because Dr. Gundry does say you can eat legumes, or at least some legumes, if you pressure cook them. In those studies that you just mentioned and, and other studies that – Matt, you've mentioned throughout this conversation, are we assuming that those subjects are preparing using kind of traditional preparation methods, either soaking and boiling or consuming canned legumes? Honestly, I would assume, and I don't have data to support this, that most people are buying canned legumes and beans. Um, and that most people are not necessarily boiling, soaking and boiling and preparing at home, unless they're very, I would imagine, health conscious people. Um, but I, I, w I would not think that the average person in the general population is consuming uh, legumes prepared in, in that type of home preparation way. I would assume they're just buying cans. 
But again, I don't have data to support that. So I'm not sure, Matt, if you've seen anything. Yeah, and I would largely agree with you. I don't have data on exactly what proportion of the population prepares legumes in a specific way. I don't even know if that data is out there. But we have to remember, um, sure, you know, there are some clinical trials, as, as Alan had pointed out. Um, and in those cases, they might get a little more direction on preparation, or they might be provided with canned legumes or, or something like that to, to consume. Um, but when I'm pointing at some of the observational data, we're talking about people in the general population, for the most part. We can't assume that these people are are soaking legumes overnight and then rinsing and then cooking and, and going through these special preparation methods or that they all have pressure cookers or the majority have pressure cookers. Um, and if it were the case that this issue of lectins was so large and causing so many problems, as Gundry kind of suggests, we should see harm in these populations because, again, this is just the general population. It's just, you know, usually tens of thousands of people within the general pop. So um, I, I don't see any really any real validity to those those claims. Uh, not that we have, you know, really good hard evidence to, to point out exactly how they're being prepared. Hey, friends, if you'd like to stay connected and reinforce the valuable insights from this show, let's connect on Instagram. You can find me at Simon Hill. That's at Simon Hill. I look forward to seeing you there. All right, let's dive back into the episode. So w why do you think Gundry is ignoring the, the studies that exist that show when you prepare beans or whole grains correctly, that 90 plus odd percent of lectins are destroyed? Or when you look at health outcome studies that people who are, who are eating more of these foods tend to have lower risk of disease, lower total mortality. Why, why do you think he's ignoring that? Do you think he's ignoring that? Do you think he's aware of that data? Well, the plant paradox retails at what, about $20? And lectin shield is 80 So there's two pretty, that's a, that's a, that's a hundred dollars per you know, per person who believes this. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty incentivized. I suppose that was a pretty silly question to ask. Speaking of lectin shield, have either of you looked at the supplement, the ingredients and, and the kind of evidence that Dr. Gundry and his team are using to support the claims? Yes. I went through the nine ingredients and all the references that were listed on the website for these ingredients or supporting their use. Um, just to, and we don't have to go through every one if you don't want, but um, but I've, I've got the notes. So the main claim on the website, uh, the Lectin Shield, uh, you know, website or where you purchase it, is that the nine potent ingredients in Lectin Shield act together to give your body full anti-lectin support making it easier for your body to digest lectin foods. Several of the components found in lectin shield help counteract the potential distressing effects of lectins. Some of the ingredients may even have useful antioxidant and anti-fatigue properties. So that's the kind of broad claim that's made. Um, and then like going through the, the ingredients, there's N-acetyl-D-glucosamine, bladderwrack, which is a type of seaweed, D-mannose, okra, um, mucin, sodium alginate, vegetable peptase, MSM, and arabinoglactans. So do you want me to go through some of the evidence for these, or some of the evidence that's listed? <clears throat> All right. So yeah, the first one was N-acetyl-D-glucosamine, and the claim is that it binds to harmful lectins from wheat. And since wheat lectins have been associated with joint problems, this wheat lectin blocker is also a popular ingredient in joint health supplements. Now, I checked the reference um, suggesting that it binds to the uh, lectins from wheat. And it, it's sort of odd because the reference doesn't really talk about N-acetyl-D-glucosamine. There's a one-off line basically saying that it blocks weak lectins um, without further explanation. Um, and then later on in that paper, the authors speculate about how it might help joint um, health by blocking the lectins responsible for rheumatoid arthritis, suggesting that lectins are responsible. But there is no real clear explanation or mechanism or anything given for that. It's just a very sort of off the cuff claim, almost it seems like. Um, 
And when you look into the data on on um, uh, glucosamine and joint health, the mechanisms really aren't clearly known at this point. There are some there's some speculation around anti-inflammatory properties. There's some speculation that it might increase hyaluronic acid synthesis, um, but it doesn't seem like it's well known. So it's just kind of odd to to make those sorts of of strong claims. The second one though. The second ingredient, I think, was one of my favorites here, and that was the bladderwrack, the seaweed. And the claim is that it's a powerful seaweed and has been shown in studies to bind to lectins. Now, the reference is an in, in vitro, so petri dish study, about how a specific lectin from a specific type of fungus can interact with certain human, uh, human cells, epithelial cells, and possibly cause inflammation. Okay? Remember, the claim is about bladderwrack, which is a seaweed. The study is about a specific lectin from a type of fungus acting on epithelial cells in a petri dish. There is no mention of bladderwrack. I checked the different names, the scientific names for it as well throughout the entire text. Nothing about it. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's it, it kind of goes back to, to what you said about the reference with uh, the eggs and the, the shellfish from the book, right? It's just not supported at all. In fact, this case is not even mentioned. So very weird. Yeah, that's that's strange. You think it's you think it's strange that a supplement contains no ingredients that actually work. Should we buy it? That's what I want to know. Probably not. I mean, yeah, like I said, we don't need to go through the rest of it, but it's just more of the same. It's it's references that like, you know, some of some of the ingredients might have been shown to bind to like one specific lectin, specific type of lectin that isn't even related to plant foods. Like some of these are looking at lectins produced by like viruses and things. Um, and um, for some reason they're in here and they're marketed as, as some sort of a lectin binder for, for plant foods. It, it doesn't make any sense. Um, there was, there was almost no actual human trial evidence cited and the little bit, there was actually one trial that was cited. It did not um, even mention the word lectin. It had nothing to do with lectins. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I would say it seems to be just a big waste of money. I mean, I don't think that's surprising. Um, and the evidence that's cited, actually, what one more, if, you, if you'll indulge me, there's one more I do want to mention because I think this one was interesting. Um, for sodium alginate, um, the claim is that when we're dealing with lectin-based digestive problems, sodium alginate can be your best friend. It also acts as a fecal bulking agent, which can help make bathroom visits much more pleasant and less frantic. Okay. The reference is a, is an uncontrolled trial with five individuals who were given sodium alginate. And this is directly ripped from the, the study, this quote. Although the dietary transit time remained constant for two volunteers, it decreased for two and increased slightly for one with little resulting change in the overall mean value. So let's just go back to the claim again. When uh, dealing with lectin-based digestive problems, it can be your best friend. It also acts as a fecal bulking agent, which can help make bathroom visits much more pleasant and less frantic. What's the evidence? Uncontrolled trial, including five individuals, where the transit time remained the same for two people, decreased for two, and increased for one. So why not just promote something like psyllium fiber, where there's a meta-analysis of like 16 RCTs on soluble fiber supplementation, improving transit time or bulking, you know, stool bulking. Why go the route of, of recommending this? It's bizarre. Um, and, and the other ingredients are, are just the same. Well, psyllium husk is not as novel and exciting probably probably a more saturated market as well let's let's summarize the the biggest takeaways for people what what are the main red flags around dr gundry's message he, he is he is a walking red flag at every level like if someone says everything we know about nutrition is wrong that's a that's a tim specter sized red flag if they're saying that Food X was claimed to be healthy, but this is why you shouldn't eat it. That's a red flag. If they're identifying a single compound, and that is, quote, root cause for all of our conditions, it's a red flag. 
Um, so even for someone that doesn't have scientific literacy or, or any background in kind of nutrition or anything like that, like, you know, who isn't getting to the specifics of, oh, he's wrong on this reference, those are all red flags that they can use to filter out a Stephen Gundry and then make sure they never listen to anything he says. Yeah, and, and I think, I mean, like you said, whenever somebody says everything you know about nutrition is wrong, that's a huge red flag. And just to give people, I, I think, something maybe a little more concrete to, to think of is when you're, whenever someone is bashing, say, dietary guidelines, like, look, there might be little things I would tweak with the guidelines, but generally speaking, they're really solid. Um, we also have evidence of people adhering more closely, having better health outcomes, as, as I pointed out earlier. So whenever somebody is saying, just throw out the guidelines, the guidelines are wrong, they're making us sick, which for starters, like 2% of people actually follow them closely or less than that. Um, that's a huge red flag. That, that's a reason to look the other way um, and to not really take what they're saying seriously. That, that bit there baffles me, blaming, blaming foods that people are not eating. <laughs> seems preposterous, really. Mm-hmm. Does anyone need to be worried about lectins at all? I mean, given that we would know uh, and do know that not cooking or eating raw beans may result in, you know, adverse, uh, you know, responses, then yes, there is that potential. Um, so obviously the recommendation would be to either buy canned legumes or if someone is really intent on buying raw legumes, properly preparing by boiling, soaking, boiling, um, and, and, and ensuring proper preparation. But, but outside of that, uh, there's really nothing in, in human data at this point that would warrant based on outcomes for these foods across a range of cardiometabolic disease there would be no reason to assume any adverse effect on human health again indeed the opposite positive effects on these outcomes so i just don't see it there might be a few listeners who are into their pb and j peanut butter and jelly and are thinking well peanuts are a legume you can't buy those in cans do we need to to roast or cook peanuts? Are they okay to consume raw? I think most peanut butters are probably roasted peanuts, ones that I've seen. But <clears throat> is it okay to eat raw peanuts? Yeah, like so there are, as we talked about many times, uh, different types of lectins. And there are certain types of lectins that don't actually uh, or aren't toxic in, in their raw form or I guess there is no raw or cooked form. They just go away. But um, but there are certain types of lectins that are safe to eat. Uh, there are even some in, say, like chickpeas that don't need to be cooked to the same degree that, uh, say, those from kidney beans would need to. So, um, no, with peanuts, they're, they're safe. They're fine to, to consume raw. All right, gents, I think that's a good place to land the plane. Um, Matt, can you remind people how they can connect with you online? Yeah, you can uh, check me out on Instagram. That's probably where I'm most active uh, at dr.matthewnagra. Uh, but I'm also on Twitter, uh, Threads now, TikTok, all that good stuff. Uh, just most active on Instagram. And Alan, I'm only active on Instagram for sanity purposes. So uh, at the nutritional advocate, all one word, and that is where you will find me. Beautiful. I appreciate you guys. Thanks so much for coming back and doing this. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode.